Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Paul Vogelzang, your host of the Not Old Better Show. As part of our Smithsonian Associates programming, the Art of Living series, our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is Chef Kwame Anwache. Born in the Bronx and trained in classical French cuisine at the Culinary Institute of America, Kwame Anwache works as the executive chef of the Shah Bijou in Washington, D.C. His interest in food was sparked by his mother, who operated a catering company while he was growing up. Kwame started his own catering company at the age of 20 before working in some highly regarded restaurants, including New York's 11 Madison Park and Per Se. He's traveled the world learning different types of cuisines and cultures and even worked on oil rigs, specifically Deepwater Horizon, which, given the film's release very soon, is a very interesting story. His philosophy on cooking can best be defined as telling a story through food. Kwame was also a contestant on Top Chef. Give a listen to today's show featuring a very interesting man with a great story and a great future. Kwame Onwache will be appearing at the Smithsonian Associates Lecture Series October 24th, starting at 6.45 p.m. at the Ripley Center in Washington, D.C. I encourage all my listeners, get your tickets early for this wonderful event, including Kwame Amwache's food, as Kwame himself will be offering a tasting of all of his great fare. So join me in welcoming to the podcast, Kwame Amwache. Chef Kwame Anwachi, welcome to the podcast. I think I've got that last name right. You're going to just have to correct me, Kwame, because my last name is Vogelzang, and, you know, it's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did a very, very good job. I've been getting my name pronounced wrong my whole life. So I can usually tell whether I was in school or at the doctor's office if they were calling me up next because they would just pause at my name and say, like, on Wu, on what? And I'd be like, that's me. That's uh-huh. me. And I'd get up and go. So you did a good job. Yeah, well, as I say, you know, I, I with a name like Vogelzang, I mean, my I have two boys and, you know, they were like 12 before they could spell it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sensitive to last names. Well, it is great to talk to you. And if you've listened to the show a little bit, you know that I enjoy talking to people who do many things with their lives. And honestly, Kwame, you seem to be that very person. So I want to talk a little bit about the upcoming Smithsonian Associates Lecture and the tasting, which is something I'm really excited about. But I really love to kind of begin at the beginning with guests. And so I thought, you know, it might be interesting for everybody to hear a little bit about your early life. Tell us a little bit about what life was like around your dinner table growing up. It seems like food has been such a super important, you know, subject. And I I just get that in all of the research I've done on you. But tell us what kind of things went on around that dinner table? Well, food was very instrumental in my childhood. My mother was an accountant and she really wanted to figure out a way to put, you know, foods in our stomach and a roof over our head, but by still maintaining a very close relationship with us and making sure we were growing up with the values that she wanted to instill. So she started a catering company within the house. So she did small events here and there, but my sister and myself were her first two employees. So we helped from everything from vegetable prep down to setting up that event. And the dinner table was interesting. You know, she's Creole so and Native American. So she has, you know, the whole Louisiana kind of style of cooking. But also we lived in, you know, Manhattan's playground in the Bronx. So we were able to kind of experience so many different types of cuisine at a very young age. And, you know, we'd be eating anything from South Indian cuisine to food from Japan or Trinidadian cuisine at the dinner table because I was just, I, I got bit by the bug very early on and I was so excited about it and interested. And she just fueled that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm at where I'm at today. That's really wonderful. I'm, I'm very close to my mom too. She's She's been a real influence and she certainly is a is a great cook. I, I'm sure nothing com- compared to, <laughs> you know, your mom and all that you experienced. It's interesting to hear you talk a little bit about kind of being one of those early employees, because I, I just think that teaches you everything and, and including, you know, not just the preparation, the consumption, but the business of food too. And I would imagine you had to learn some of that and you're applying that now to the new restaurant. And, and for my listeners, I want to make sure everybody knows this. This is Kwame's new restaurant and we'll talk a little bit more about it. 
but certainly its name is the Shaw Bijou. It's at 1544 Ninth Street in Washington, D.C. We'll put links up, Kwame, to the restaurant and where you can kind of get, you know, tickets and get all that information. But but we will talk about it. But yeah, there, there's a kind of a distinction that needs to be made sometimes between food preparation, food consumption, and kind of the business of food. There's often, you know, tight margins in that industry. How, how are you kind of applying all those lessons to this endeavor? You know, like you said, it carries over. When I was younger, those margins helped put food on our table. You know, keeping those margins, every extra dollar that my mother spent was a dollar that could go to either rent or electricity. And I think having that mindset as a, at a very young age, it kind of molded me into the person I am today, you know, and that carries over to the restaurant that I'm at now. You know, every single thing should be accounted for and you shouldn't skimp on quality because when my mother was cooking, if she didn't knock that event out of the park, then she wouldn't get a return phone call. And I think that's the same thing that I'm pretty much trying to do on a day-to-day basis. We're not just trying to sell tickets to, to get money. We're trying to sell tickets so people can come in and enjoy our experience and come back and keep coming back and keep telling their friends. And that word of mouth is what carries great restaurant. And I'm just trying to emulate that motto. Yeah, all the reviews indicate that you're more than emulating. That You are really hitting this out of the park too, just, just like your mom. I, I read about Danny Meyer, the, you know, the hospitality and comfort food, you know, kind of impresario that when he was a boy, he really loved looking at people's shopping carts while they were in the supermarket. And he, whenever he travels, he, he loves to kind of check out open air markets today. And I wondered, as you were working as a young boy with your mom and your sister, what was it that you observed about people and, you know, about how they eat and, you know, what really grabbed them? Were there some lessons you learned about that too? Mostly what really intrigued me as a kid was different families' palates. And I think it was the, the first time that really came prevalent to me was I was younger and I really asked my mother if I can spend the night at my friend's house. So I go spend the night and they have boiled peewee potatoes with stovetop stuffing and like well done like roast and they ate it with ketchup. And I was just like, what's going on here? You know, because my mother, like she would make you know, she made stuffing. It was from scratch. And we pretty much only had that at a certain time of year. You know, if we made potatoes, they'd be crispy, you know, or cooked in oil slowly. And if it was steak, it was cooked properly and basted in butter. And it was not served with ketchup. So for me, that kind of opened my eyes. And I was like, oh, wow. The reason why I eat this way is because my mother kind of knows how to cook. And not everyone knows that. So at a very young age, I was kind of intrigued by the way that people were excited about food, even if it wasn't at a level of what I thought was not hot cuisine. I didn't really know what that was at the time, but I thought I knew what tastes good. But to other people, they had their other versions of like what the best meal was. And I've always been intrigued by that. That's why I've never really shunned any industry or any chef, whether it's a, I don't know, a hamburger joint or a personal chef or a private chef or a caterer or this, so, you know, this, that, and, and, and forth, it's everyone has their own idea of what good cuisine is because of their upbringing and their childhood and their culture. So I've always really been intrigued by that. And that's what I try to bring home kind of in my restaurant is that I make approachable yet refined cuisine, you know, something that looks unfamiliar, but tastes so familiar. You know, you look at it and you're like, oh, this is beautiful. And then you taste it and it's like, oh, this brings me back to, you know, something that I ate when I was a kid. And I just want to create those moments. I love that, that it might not look like something that you would be familiar with, but it has tastes that you might be familiar with. So did some exactly. of that, yeah, that, that's really nice. Uh, did, did some of that influence come from living in Africa and living in Nigeria with your, with your grandparents and some of the tastes that you kind of experienced there? I would say it really came from my mother and then just eating the food that she prepared or the way that she would critique food. You know, I think she would always she's eaten at really nice restaurants and then she's eaten in back roads in Louisiana. So it's like for her, like, does this taste amazing? Like forget about technique, forget about the decor, forget about, you know, the plates that it's on. It's like, does this really taste good? Is this tasty? Do I crave this? And that's what I kind of took from. And that's how I like, whether I'm eating a sandwich from a bodega or I'm eating a sandwich from Black Sea Bagels in New York City, I'm thinking of the same thing. I'm like, is this delicious? Whether it's $3 or it's $13, to me, it should just be delicious and I should crave it. I know too, when you were younger, and again, I, I know that you're much younger than me, but I know that <laughs> one of your jobs was to go work you know, geographically on the, on the Gulf Coast for some of the oil spill crews. And 
that must have been interesting because the appetites must have been enormous. And so, oh yeah. So was it about tastes even then, or was it just about sheer volume? <laughs> no, it was taste and volume. All those guys had to do was clean up oil and eat. That's the only and sleep. Those are the only things they look look forward to. So the food had to be good and it had to be a lot of it. There were two chefs on the boat, so one would have we would switch shifts. So. Let's say for the first day to start off, I would cook breakfast, lunch, and then that cook, next cook would cook dinner, then breakfast, and I would cook lunch and dinner, and then he would cook breakfast, lunch, and so on and so forth. We'd switch shifts. So if one cook was cooking better than you, you can feel it in the ship. I mean, the ship was only so big. There was 40 people on the ship. So if, you know, you, you had to really bring your chops and cook well. That's interesting. So how did that job even come about? Because I, I, I've really got this impression from you and kind of doing the research that you, you really, you know, I mean, you're a hard worker from a very early age, the influence of your mom, but getting a job on a boat cooking for <laughs> or these, these wild, I mean, the, this is, we're talking deep water horizon, right? I mean, that, yeah, that's exactly insane. deep water horizon. <laughs> Yeah. So we're in charge of people's lives, you know, food yeah. safety. Is, it's a very serious thing. So looking back on it, it's pretty funny how I got that job. But I applied. My mother was an executive chef of a catering company in New Orleans. And one of the temporary cooks came in and he was like, yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow. And I'm like, where are you going? Like, you're really good. You're not going to stay. And he's like, no, man, I'm going to Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Like they're paying like $1,500 a week to go out there and, and cook for like these these oil store workers. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, you cook for 35 guys. It's really easy. And I was like, all right, well, can you like try to get me on there? And he was like, yeah, of course. So he hooked me up with a job essentially. And the next thing I know, I'm driving down to home of Louisiana to get on this boat and I get on there and the, I meet the cook, like the, uh, the other chef. And he's like, you're going to be my sous chef. And I was like, all right, whatever. And he was like, can you read? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he was like, I've got a lot of like people coming in here from Louisiana. They can't read. They don't even know how to spell their name. And so I just walked out <laughs> to the office and I was like, I'm going to cook my food and you're going to cook your food. I'm going to do lunch, dinner. You're going to do breakfast, lunch, and we're going to go so, so on and so forth. And then within three weeks after they taste my food, they just kicked him off the boat and then got a new guy for me to like act as my sous chef and tell it happened. So you sometimes you just got to know, you know, you just got to know, yeah. and you just got to do. <laughs> you got to stick with it. Exactly. Exactly. Well, for my audience, again, we are talking with Chef Kwame Amwachi. And Chef Kwame is going to be speaking October 24th, 6.45 p.m. at the Ripley Center in downtown D.C. as part of the Smithsonian Associates Lecture Series. My personal advice to all my listeners is get your tickets now for this event. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I think, Kwame, this is going to be exciting for everyone. I know there's going to be some sampling. I'm hoping personally that we're going to have some eggnog. That's one of my all-time favorites. I, I love that <laughs> that's a dessert favorite of yours. But tell us a little bit about the event and, you know, kind of what we can expect. And this is a great program. And to see your name amongst all of the various lecturers and experts, what a treat. We, uh, you know, it's just going to be so great for our audience. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited to be a part of it. You know, I'm very, very humbled to be kind of, you know, amongst the great lecturers that are going to be there. And I'm just going to pretty much tell my story. I feel like it's a story that needs to be heard. I'm actually writing a book on it now called Chasing Happiness. I'm just going to give kind of a sneak peek of that and tell people how I got to where I'm at today at the tender age of 26. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that'll be that'll be a wonderful book and a wonderful story. And, and we will connect with you again on, on that story. So but I, but I got to touch on eggnog. So do you have a special recipe for eggnog? <laughs> I do. I, I can't share that with you. It's oh, my mom's recipe. OK. OK. Well, and you don't you don't always have to have dark rum or brandy in the eggnog, right? No, no. You can do whatever you want. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. But rum, I really like rum and also spiced rum is really good in it as well because it adds another level of complexity. Oh, that's great. Well, tell us a little bit about the restaurant, the Shah Bijou. That name is interesting too. So, so tell us a little bit about where that comes from, the name of it. Yeah, so the Shah Bijou is located in the historic Shah District of Washington, D.C. And Bijou is jewel in French, which is my mother's name. Um, I always wanted to name my first, yeah, thank you, my first yeah. restaurant after her. And it's kind of like kind of like a double entendre, you know, it's the jewel of the Shah, 
and, you know, Shaw's Bijou, which is my mother. So that's where the name comes from. But the restaurant is a small fine dining restaurant. It's 28 seats, about eight tables. And, you know, we, we specialize in modern American cuisine with a background in French technique. You know, and, you know, people always ask me, like, what does that really mean? You know, all these rest- new restaurants are coming out, like new American, modern American. For me, I feel the way that I approach it is I'm just taking influences from different cultures and applying them to the best ingredients that I can and interpreting them through my eyes. So I'm not doing fusion. I'm not reinventing the wheel. You may see a 60-day age dry age Wagyu spiced with Ethiopian spices and seared and matched with fermented parsnips with the yuzu bermonte. You know, now that has influences from Ethiopia, Japan, and France. So... I feel taking things together and you won't be able to say like, ah, this is a Nigerian dish, but you're going to say this is good. And when the server or captain spills something to you, they'll be able to tell the story and elaborate on it in a much more eloquent way than normal. And and I think it just it just is going to be in keeping with this kind of worldview that you have of food and that we're going to just have an experience. I mean, 28 seats is going to be just a very, you know, almost a just a one on one intimate kind of experience with you, with the restaurant, with the. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really great. Kwame, we will put links up to the restaurant, the Shah Bijou. It's going to be on Ninth Street. I saw pictures of it. We'll put a couple pictures up on the website too, but that's actually, that's a former home there. Is, is that right? Yeah, it's pretty much around 200-year-old Italianate row house that we've turned into a restaurant. So it's a beautiful space that has so much character. And it's one of the reasons why I came to D.C. The investors that reached out to me, we had drinks at a coffee shop beforehand. They were like, you know, let me go and show you the space. It's like right down the street. So we're walking down and I see this beautiful navy blue building with ivy crawling on on the outside of it. You know, it's like fall foliage. So the ivy leaves are like red, orange, green. And I'm like, man, I really hope that that's the building. You know, we keep walking past it and they're like, oh, sorry, the building's right there. And they pointed at that exact building. Hmm. And once I walked in, I was like, I'm sold. I'm coming to D.C. Well, it meant to be. And we're thrilled to have you. Absolutely. I think this is going to be just a great spot for all of us to check out as well as to Thank check you. you out, at, of course, and at Smithsonian Associates. But since you brought up D.C., you'll be there at the Ripley Center. I think D.C. is kind of an interesting location for your first restaurant for a lot of reasons. And, and, you know, as somebody who's from the Bronx originally and has traveled the world, you know, picking D.C. might even be considered, you know, food related as well as, you know, maybe some personal beliefs. And I wanted to touch on for just a second, a nonprofit organization that you're very much a part of, and that's called No Kid Hungry. In my research as well, I found the great food writer MFK Fisher, who wrote that first we eat, then we do everything else. And I thought about you in relation to that and kind of your work with No Kid Hungry, that food is just, it's so basic to our needs that, you know, we've got to have that first and foremost. And mm-hmm. and that food is intertwined with security and, and even love. And so all of this points to this kind of interesting vantage point that you have about food and hunger and nutrition. And, and I think as a chef, that's important to bring forward too. So, you know, it's a long-winded question, I know, but does DC have some importance to you from that perspective too, from this idea of hunger and you know, what children are kind of facing with issues of nutrition and how you might play a role there. I mean, Chef Roy Choi is doing some of that stuff with local and in Watts and in Oakland. And now here you are in in D.C. So tell us why that issue is important to you. I don't think you can bring up, you know, a topic about food and not talk about either food waste or, you know, hunger or obesity or things like that, problems that we face so many more times than none in America, which is unfortunate. So coming to D.C. is definitely has some sort of influence in what kind of change that I can do and what I can bring to the table, you know, because I came I came from the inner city, you know, and I got I was very fortunate to have parents that guided me in the right direction. And I think a lot of kids within the inner city lack just that which is guidance. And at the Shaw Bijou, we deal with no kid hungry. You know, we did a pop up for this concept that I had for Philly cheesesteaks mm-hmm. and we donated all of our proceeds to No Get Hungry. We work with the Southeast White House in obtaining mentees so we can kind of guide them in the right direction. Southeast White House is a nonprofit organization that takes in anybody pretty much. So their policy is we have an open door policy. So it's a large mansion in Southeast DC in the inner city 
where you can come in and say, Hey, I need a job. And they're like, okay, well, we have soup kitchens every Sunday here for the homeless. So work at soup kitchens and we'll pay you. Or I need a place to stay. Like, okay, you can stay here. You can stay in one of these rooms, but you're going to earn your keep. So you'll work downstairs in the soup kitchen. So it's one of those. And they're very influential within their community. So they do the Santa Claus on in Christmas and invite all the kids in the neighborhood and give them bicycles and things like that. So they have kind of like a relationship within the inner city that I don't have yet, but I'm trying to build that. So they're sending me people that they know within the community that are interested in food, but don't know how to really go about taking that next step. So they'll come to the restaurant and intern with us and start at the bottom and see the inner working. So hopefully when they graduate high school, they'll go on to culinary school or they'll just start working in a restaurant if they can't afford to do so. So DC is very, very near and dear to my heart because of those opportunities that were presented, but as well as my grandfather taught at Howard and he was a civil rights leader. So all of those things are very, very important to me. And I'm pretty sure that's why I was called to come to DC. So I can make a change with the platform that I do have. That's really wonderful. That's a powerful sentiment. And and you can tell that this is who you are. I, I think it is a gift that you bring, not just the food, but the value of who you are as a person, as well as the economy and, and what those potential jobs do for young people who do need some of that guidance from, mm-hmm. from a strong hand. So I'm impressed. Well, let me ask you really just one kind of final question, Kwame. If you could sit down for a meal with anybody, uh, past, present, future, even, who would that be and why? For a meal with anyone? Yeah. I think President Obama right now, because I feel it's very daunting as a young chef kind of like to deal through ad- the adversity sometimes of like taking that next step without people like truly believing in you and you have to believe in yourself more than they do. And I feel like for him to become president of the United States and people continuously bashing him and him kind of not really thinking about them and putting his blinders on going forward. I just want to see what it was like to do that because he's one of the reasons why I'm here. Because I once once he was elected president, I thought if he can do that, then I can do anything. So well, I'm sure that President Obama is as impressive a person as he is would be very impressed with your story too, Kwame. And I certainly was in doing this research. What a pleasure. It is to speak with you. I'm Thank looking you. forward to the event. Oh, of course. And again, that's October 24th. It's going to be at the Ripley Center in uh, downtown DC. Go to the Smithsonian Associates website to get tickets, get tickets early to see and meet Kwame. Kwame, anything else you want to add before we just kind of break off? But, you know, we'll put links up to the Shabiju. We'll put links up to No Kid Hungry. But I would love to have you come back and talk about your book, too. So what, what, else, do we, what else do we need to know about you today? I think we covered a lot. It's really excited to open up. And thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Oh, of course, Kwame. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you on October 24th at the uh, Ripley Center. Chef Kwame on watch. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks to all my guests today, all the help on the podcast, and especially to Media Studio Edit and the great work by Wayne Brown and his team for editing the podcast and making me sound so much better. That is to say, not old, but better. Thanks to all.